Okay, we're back. We're live. Uh, here it is on Wednesday in Community Matters. We're talking about the age of dignity today with uh, Ai Jen Poo. She's a MacArthur Fellow, and she's the original uh, achiever. <laughs> May I say that? <laughs> and so this is really a story of achievement, and we want to explore exactly what you've done, mm -hmm. how you've done it, and why you've done it. And, and uh, I guess the other part of that is how it's going to affect people, mm. or it is affecting people. So, I just welcome to the show. So happy to talk to you. Thank you. Great <laughs> to be with you. <laughs> so here, uh, first thing is uh, you're a MacArthur Fellow, and I guess that's news. Um, but tell us, what is a MacArthur Fellow, and how do you get to be one? Where do I sign up? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wish I knew. It's a big mystery. Um, a MacArthur Foundation, based in Chicago, uh, chooses a class of fellows every year of people that they want to support for a five-year fellowship program um, to continue doing exactly what they've been doing, essentially. That is so cool. It is so cool. Uh, there's no special requirements, and I think the idea is that they're investing in leaders and people who are contributing to their fields in unusual ways, unique ways, and deserve to be supported to continue to do their work with as much freedom uh, as possible. So that's what the fellowship uh, is. It's splendid. really a dream. It's, yeah. It really is. So but I want to go back to the moment where you got the letter or the call <laughs> or the email or the Twitter, or whatever, telling you that you had been selected. And at that point, you probably asked yourself, why me? So why you? Um, well, I've spent the last 17 years working alongside thousands of incredibly talented, courageous women many of whom work as domestic workers, nannies, housekeepers, caregivers who work inside of other people's homes. And as a movement of organizations around the country, we have taken what's been a very invisible and undervalued form of work and brought it to the public attention. And we're now working hard to bring dignity and respect and fair working conditions to this workforce around the country. That's great. Um, but, you know, um, why are you interested in this topic? What, what little, really bad steps in your life have taken you to this topic? Well, there's a few factors. One is that two of my most important inspirations are my mother and my grandmother, both of whom are very caring, very hardworking women who raised me to believe that women should be able to do anything we um, set our sights and dream to do. And um, at the same time, I watched how hard they worked, how much they struggled to work, go to school, learn English, raise children. And much of the work that they did to, to raise families was not valued. It was not respected. It was not really accounted for. And we're living in a moment with the baby boom generation starting to reach retirement age and the need for care simply exploding around the country, that um, this notion that we can take for granted the work that women do to support families is simply not tenable anymore. And so this workforce is the fastest growing occupation in the nation. And, um, and so I saw an opportunity to not only increase and improve economic opportunity for women um, and transform what has historically been low wage jobs but also an opportunity to create new jobs to meet the growing needs of families, working families who struggle every day to meet their caregiving needs. So um, thinking about win-win solutions for the future. Well, it's a perfect storm. You have baby boomers getting older, mm -hmm. you have people who need to you know, be respected and, and have the dignity, and then the two of them come together, exactly. and they create a, a better life for both sides of the equation. Exactly, and yeah. potentially an economic solution to inequality. Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, something you said made me think that a lot of the people in this category, domestic workers mm -hmm. and the like, are immigrants. It's true. So tell us what the demographics are in the group that you're talking about. It's a really long and interesting history. This uh, workforce has often, for, throughout its entire history, been women of color, um, very low income women, immigrant women, um, women who are of marginalized social status in different ways. Uh, today, we estimate that at least a third of the workforce is immigrant, um, many of whom are undocumented. 
and still many uh, women of color, African American women doing this work, particularly throughout the South. So um, it's a very diverse workforce, women who are working hard, supporting families, caring for their own children, supporting the families they work for, and still earning poverty wages. Mm struggling. I'm beginning to get the idea about the MacArthur Fellow now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're also the director of the National, I'm sure it's totally related, it the is. National uh, Domestic Workers Alliance. Uh -huh. <laughs> so actually I often tell people that the MacArthur, the, the real genius is the movement itself, the organization, which is the National Domestic Workers Alliance. And we have 45 local affiliate organizations in 26 cities around the country, all of whom are working to raise the level of respect and recognition for this work, improve these jobs, offer workforce training, create a real culture of fairness and dignity in the care industry. Um, and, uh, and these are women who um, really, you know, against all odds, assert the dignity of their work and really support our families, caring for the most precious element of elements of our lives, our children, our aging loved ones. And so this movement, the National Domestic Workers Alliance, has been working to pass legislation in states. And in fact, here in Hawaii, a Domestic Workers Bill of Rights passed and was signed by the governor two years ago and is now being enforced and implemented. It's a statute, not a resolution, but no, a statute. No, it's a law. That's right. New, Give us the general idea of what it says. It's basically ensuring that domestic workers are protected by the same labor protections as other workers. Um, so that eliminating previous exclusions that have been in place for over 75 years. So protection from discrimination and harassment, um, wage and hour protection, making sure that there's adequate days of rest, things like that. Well, that's great. So national, you established it. National, four states have passed bills, um, uh, Massachusetts being the most recent that went into effect on April 1st. More states are coming on board, um, and we're working at the federal level as well. You, you established it. Uh, not me alone. Okay. 50 women in a really? room oh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, yeah, okay, right. that's what Major. I say. The genius is a collective genius. Oh, absolutely. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, it's getting people together. Exactly. You know, that makes things happen. That's right. That's so right. The, this is really um, this is really the, the right time for this. I mean, because I, I, you haven't mentioned it yet, but I'm sure you will. Namely, you know, the baby boomers are um, uh, they're at great risk. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, healthcare issues. Mm -hmm. uh, their retirements have gone away or shrunk That's right. to a large extent. That's right. Uh, there aren't facilities sufficient for them. Um, a lot of them uh, worked all their lives and you know don't have much to show for it economically. Mm -hmm. uh, so this this kind of handshake that you're describing really is the right moment in time. It's it, both on both sides. That's right, and that's exactly why I wrote this book called The Age of Dignity: Preparing for the Elder Boom in a Changing America. And the elder boom is what some call the silver tsunami. Um, I call it the elder boom because I think there's a lot of opportunity within it. So on the one hand, you have the boomers turning 65 at a rate of 10,000 people per day. Four million people per year turn 65 in America. Mm -hmm. And then you have, because of advances in healthcare, people living longer than ever. So my grandmother is actually, her demographic of 85 and older fastest growing demographic in the country. So by the year 2030, we will have more than 20% of our population over the age of 65. And by the year 2050, get this one, 27 million of us will need some form of care or assistance to meet our basic daily needs. Will it needs. be there? And it, right now, the issue is that there is no real system or infrastructure to support that need. So if you're very, very wealthy, you might be able to afford long-term care insurance. And if you're incredibly impoverished, meaning no assets whatsoever, you're eligible for Medicaid. But the millions of us in between have no support. And the age of dignity is all about some solutions that we could put into place, what I call a care grid, a new infrastructure to support the care needs of the changing context that we live in today. So what, you know, what is the, where does it fit in the continuum of American history? 
this, this moment you described. Mm -hmm. I mean, was it so that, you know, 20, 30 years ago, people were better off? And I can tell you a short story that makes me believe that in some ways that's true. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, what, is, what can you do to change this phenomenon, this sea change that you've identified? My story, by the way, is when I first came out to Hawaii, my wife, uh, then my, my fiance, took me out to her family town mm -hmm. in Kauai, and we saw where mm -hmm. the elderly people lived, and they lived in, in, a, in a kind of mm, backyard affair with um, Quonset huts and you know, tin roofs mm -hmm. um, in little tiny rooms, but everyone cared for them. Mm -hmm. Everyone came down. Mm -hmm. Everyone offered them food, talked to them. It was a wonderful community. Mm -hmm. It was to, to be, you know, um, uh, to, be, to be repeated if possible. Um, I don't think that kind of thing exists anymore now. It's all economic, you've got to write a check. And so maybe what we have here is the, you know, the loss of the good old days mm -hmm. and uh, the, the nuclear family you know, is all over the country, mm -hmm. nobody to take care of the old folks. Right, I think that that model of neighbors helping neighbors, communities coming together to care for one another across generations, that kind of an ethic absolutely has to be a core part of our future. It's an all hands on deck situation with so many of us who are gonna need care and over 40 million of us are providing care already for a family member. And so, and oftentimes we're doing it under incredible stress Right, fearful that we yeah, lose true. our jobs. As you get older, those um, you know, chronic diseases and the like are burdensome on the people around you. Oh, absolutely, and they don't have to be. So in, in a lot of ways, I think Hawaii is ahead of the game because on the one hand, culturally, there is a tradition in many communities of neighbors helping neighbors. As I saw in Kauai. As you saw in Kauai, exactly. And then at the public policy level, Hawaii has actually spent several years um, and there's been many cycles of this, of bringing stakeholders together to study the long-term care needs of the state. And they've made a set of recommendations for state-level policy and have introduced legislation that would create a new social insurance program for long-term care. And as a result of this, Hawaii is more prepared than any state in the entire country for what's to come. Um, so we are really, the reason why I'm ending my book tour in the state of Hawaii is because this is the state that will lead the way, in our opinion, nationally for where we need to go. Well, that's wonderful. Great mm -hmm. to hear. We do have some, we do have some good points, I guess. Eh? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a sense of um, cur courage, really, to address the social needs of our time. And at a time in this country when politics seems so gridlocked, that kind of groundedness in the human needs of the people of the state is exactly the kind of leadership that we I, need. But I get from what you say that a lot of this is on a humanitarian level. But yes. it seems to me that there's also economic reasons for us to care. I mean, of course, care, but care in the sense is if we help them, that helps us as a community deal better with the economic burdens of not helping them. Right. Um, talk to me about that. It's a very practical question in a lot of ways. Uh, three quarters of all of our health care costs are spent in the latter years of life. And we believe that good caregiving is the best prevention. People who are on the front lines with patients day in and day out, helping to make sure medication is taken on time, helping to monitor temperatures, diet and nutrition. I mean, these quality of life building blocks are precisely the things that will help us avoid unnecessary emergency room visits, manage chronic illnesses. Expensive. These are all things that are incredibly expensive that investing in caregiving and the caregiving workforce can actually help create new cost efficiencies. So in a lot of ways, we're looking at a down payment on a more efficient system long term. You speak like an author. <laughs> are you? Are you? Are you a professional author? I just wrote a book. I don't know that I'm a professional author, but I did just write a book with a lot of help from a lot of people in our movement who really care about this issue, who see this as a moment. And, you know, like you said, it was there's there's been lots of changes, and we're in a moment of change. And just like we made a major infrastructure investment in highways, right, in the transportation infrastructure at one era in the economic development of this country, 
I think we need a major infrastructure investment in caregiving to support working families. Okay, and when we come back from this break, I would like to talk about how you prevail on legislators and government infrastructure to recognize the priorities and what you ask of them and how you integrate that with your moral approach to the larger population. It's a long question. Mm -hmm. I'll break it down. We'll I be like right it. back. <laughs> I like it. Okay, that's uh, Anjan Pu. She's a MacArthur Fellow. She's a director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, a co-director of the Caring Across Generations program. And she's on a book tour uh, for her new book, The Age of Dignity, Preparing for the Elder Boom in a Changing America. Wow. And uh, she's going to be speaking, actually, tomorrow at St. Andrew's Cathedral uh, and doing book signing there. We'll be right back after this short break. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Okay, we're back. Uh, we're live with Anjan, Anjan Poo. She's MacArthur Fellow and Director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and a co-director of the uh, Caring Across Generations. She's concerned about domestic workers, and she's trying to put them together with caring for an aging population. And we're calling this show The Age of Dignity, which is I'm really understanding now. So you asked me during the break that I should tell you a story. I will. Great. Okay. Um, in the nuclear age, the nuclear family, when people go across the country, their, their education takes them far away. The military sometimes takes them far away. Mm -hmm. um, their professions take them far away. Who knows where, you know, it's like hard to stay in one place. Mm -hmm. You're always, you know, motivated to move. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you leave your family behind. Okay? So when you finally settle down, you're not going to move so much anymore, and you pretty much get rooted to, you know, your final place, you know, domicile. Um, you find yourself without family, alone. And then you find, uh, especially in the case where your kids are far away or where you don't have kids, you find yourself aging without family infrastructure around you. And in these days, as we alluded to earlier, there's a lot of chronic things that could happen to you and your spouse that make it very hard. And there's an infrastructure out there that doesn't make it easy for people to come in and help you at home. And so your career is busted if your spouse is ill. Mm -hmm. You become the caregiver. Mm -hmm. A lot of people I know had brilliant careers going on, but those have been impeded because uh, they had to take care of their spouse. Of course they did. Um, there's got to be a better way. There's such a waste of, of human resource. And talent. That this should, and talent. And, and, and brilliance that, that serves the community so well, and it, it, is, it is taken off the firing line. It is removed to the sidelines. And so I think that's what you're talking about, but what can we do about it? We need to support family caregivers in a whole new way in this country. There's so many caring family members who do what we would all want to do, which is make incredible sacrifices to care for our loved ones. They should be rewarded, not punished in this economy for doing so. And that is the kind of value shift that needs to happen. When I talk about preparing for the elder boom in a changing America, the changes in this country necessitate that we account for and support caregivers in a whole new way. That's the only way we'll be able to, as you say, really tap into the full human potential of working people in this country. And we need it. I mean, we need 
It's an all hands on deck situation. We've got lots of challenges to address, lots of problems to solve, lots of innovation to drive. We need all the talent we can get. And if everyone's struggling to balance childcare and elder care and all family members with Alzheimer's and so much else with so little support, how are we gonna do that? So the question is, how do we make this issue a national priority? The way that national, it's a national security question in our, in, in our I opinion. agree with you, absolutely. And it should be a priority, and yet it's so rarely in the public conversation about public policy. And you asked the question earlier about how do we um, talk to legislators and get them to understand the urgency of this issue. And oftentimes what we do is just ask them the very question I asked you, which is, what is your care story? This is a good way to start. Because it brings it right home to an issue that everyone is struggling with in one way or another, but we've not made it a question of public policy solutions for the future, and yeah. we need to. Yeah. It's time. Yeah, well, I, I absolutely agree. And uh, let, me, let me offer this thought. Just listening to you makes me think of the fact that um, we're losing the talent. Uh, we can't afford to lose the talent. We can't. For two reasons. I mean, one is the economy. You know, we're in, a, we're in a competitive economic world now. That's right. Our economy must be humming all the time. And we've lost, you know, ground in some areas. Um, it's gone away for us in some areas. So we have to use every single productive element we can use. And this is right there. It's right in front of us. That's right. You know, it's so easy to have this. All we have to do is take advantage. At the same time, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an American morality involved. We claim to be a very moral country. I think tumultuously moral, maybe a <laughs> better term. <laughs> but at the mm -hmm. bottom, it's moral. Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, great laws that have been articulated by the courts and the people and, and all the, uh, the contentions that have happened since the revolution. Um, and we, we care fundamentally about these issues. But if things happen where it appears we are not caring, we damage our own view of our country. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like reverse patriotism, mm. where we don't believe in each other. That's right. We don't believe in the social compact, that the social compact can help us. That's right. And it's an important time to raise that point, because so much of our social policy is rooted in a different era. And ultimately, um, you know, everything from our labor laws to our safety net needs to be updated and upgraded for this 21st century globalized reality that we're living in today. So we need the talent and the innovation to help us think about what is the social contract for the future, for the 21st century that can truly support economic opportunity, equity, dignity for the 21st century. And if we're constantly fighting against one another over crumbs, allowing our communities to be pitted against one another at the moment when we should be turning towards one another, thinking about how do we care for one another across generations, as opposed to thinking about or allowing ourselves to be um, pitted against one another in budget fights and things like that. I mean, this is a moment to really shift towards one another and towards the future, really looking at what is it going to take to strengthen opportunity across generations in this moment of change. Who would ever oppose you if you visited them in their office in a legislative you know, facility somewhere? Who would ever say no to that? Are there people who say no to that? There are. You know who would say no is nursing home, uh, the nursing home lobby. There are many wonderful nursing homes out there, but they have a very powerful industry lobby that is afraid because more and more people want to age in place in their homes and communities as opposed to go into an institution. And in our view for the future of the care industry, we would be investing in more home and community-based choices to support people to have the choice to age the way that they want to. And oftentimes, living independently is a better quality of life for people. And so um, there's a fear on the part of the nursing home industry that uh, if we expand home and community-based care, really invest in a care infrastructure that supports those choices, that that'll have a negative impact on that industry. 
And you know, the fact is, we've got to we've got to move into the 21st century and think about the future. And 90% of Americans prefer aging it in it at home in place. Sure. So we've got to support that. Sure. And you know, we live in a time when so many people are down in the legislature talking about you know, their own kuleana, their own silo of mm. interest. It's self-interested. And the job of the legislature is not to be affected by either campaign contributions or passionate arguments by people who are protecting their own interests. Agreed. You have to go, you have to listen most, it's a priorities thing, to the person who is t talking from the common good. And that's, that's, what, right. that's what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, that is the responsibility of leadership to yeah. listen to the people, to respond to human needs, real human needs in the community, to ensure opportunity. So what, what, what is religion, what role does religion play in this whole issue? Is it a positive one? I mean, you know, I think religion often is very humane. On the other hand, religion also is, um, you know, uh, stands in the way sometimes of, of good rational decisions for elders. Mm -hmm. um, where does religion play in this? I think that religion is so non, it's so uh, diverse, not monolithic at all. And the notion that we should love thy neighbor is a huge part of the solution well, that's here. that's in all religions. And that's in all religions. Do one to others. That ethic of we are interconnected and interdependent as human beings. Um, and that that should underlie that the value of the, of the human relationship uh, is really critical to all of our um, health and well-being, I think, cuts across religions. And I would like us to emphasize that piece of what we sure. share. So let's try to reinforce the, the part that, that works. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, about mm, two years ago, there was a very interesting program on uh, 60 Minutes mm -hmm. where they examined um, people who were uh, vegetable in... Uh, in hospital facilities. Mm -hmm. They were way beyond thinking or caring. But their families wanted them to stay alive, and so they were white, you know, connected with all kinds of tubes. And there was no insurance, so the government had to pay. It was a sort of an unbudgeted expense, uh, and you could be there in that bed with all those tubes and cost the taxpayers $10,000 a day without a single thought in your, in your mind because you were vegetable. Mm -hmm. And so where does that fit? I mean, I, I mean, I'm asking a larger question. You know, you say dignity. What about death with dignity? Where does that fit in the worldview that you are expressing? Absolutely. It, it fits in that um, a lot of what I'm talking about is rather than denying and delaying death as a focus, we should be focusing on quality of life. And, um, and, and making a plan, facing the fact that aging and dying is a part of life. It's a natural part of our realities. And that the more we can come together as families across generations and have a plan, have a conversation over the dinner table about what could it mean to care for one another? What is our vision as we grow older? And how do we think about what it means to die with dignity? These are difficult conversations, for sure. But they to have those conversations from a place of preparation and planning and peace with the natural cycles of life, uh, I think, can be transformative in terms of quality of life while we're here. And it'd be very healthy for a family to talk about those things. Families need honest uh, dinner table conversations. Absolutely. And we have on our website for our book tour discussion guides for families well, to that's have great. for have for having those conversations and planning for caregiving. And we actually think that and we've heard reports from families that when you have these conversations, a lot of joy can come of it, of planning together, working together and getting to know each other in the context of being proactive about supporting getting each other. Getting to know each other at some special level. Yeah. We're going to take a break now, last break. Uh, this is uh, Ai Jin Poo. Uh, she's a MacArthur Fellow. She's director of the uh, um, National Domestic Workers Alliance, a co-director of the Caring Across Generations organizations. She's written a book called The Age um, of Dignity, Preparing for the Elder Boom in a Changing America. When we come back, we'll talk about her views of where this is all going to go, how successful the effort will be, and what we can see in five or ten years. But first, we're going to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. This is Alice Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Okay, we, we are dealing with the age of dignity here today with Ai-Jin Poo. She's a MacArthur Fellow and much more. And I now am beginning to fully understand why they called her that day in Chicago and totally wanted to be a, they wanted her to be a MacArthur Fellow. So um, to carry on a little further with this, um, so you, you, you're writing, you're on a book tour, you're going to talk tomorrow at the St. Andrew's Cathedral about your, your book. You're running these two, uh, or participating at the leadership of these two organizations. You're trying to put these two interesting synergy, a, a synergy of these two interesting factors in American life together mm -hmm. for, for a win-win. It was an extraordinary, uh, you know, place that you found in the, in the historical continuum. Um, how successful have you been? Um, how, what kind of, uh, you know, reception have you gotten here, mm -hmm. uh, and where do you think it's going to go? Our campaign is called Caring Across Generations, and it was started in July of 2011. And since then, more than 200 local, state, and national organizations have joined, everyone from the National Council on Aging to the Center for Community Change, to lots of unions, home care unions, um, to women's organizations, civil rights groups, all kinds of groups, including immigrant rights groups, because immigrants will be a huge part of the solution to as this nation's, as we discussed, to this nation's care needs. So this issue of caregiving intersects with just about every issue that Americans care about. Wages, economy, inequality, opportunity, workforce, and family. What could be more important than family, health, and work to Americans? Mm -hmm. So it kind of brings all of these issues together, and people really are starting to see it. Once we start to open the conversation about what are your caregiving needs, how are they changing, what are you struggling with, it becomes so clear that there's such a wealth of emotional experience, energy, and passion for change. And so our movement has been growing exponentially. We've got an online community that's growing all the time. More than 125,000 people have joined. And people are mobilizing in states around the country. And right here in Hawaii, we're really excited because it is the leading vision for a public policy solution at the state level. And there's about 10 other states who are watching very closely about what Hawaii is going to be doing and how these recommendations impact the life of people here. So my goal is that within the next five years, we would not only have legislation passed in Hawaii, but it would be implemented and we would be shining the kind of national spotlight on it so that it could be what Massachusetts was for health care reform, right? Really leading the way for the rest of the country on solutions real solution. You want to spend more time out here? I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's in it what's in it for you? I mean, where are you going from here, Ajin? Um, is this uh, so now you have these organizations, you have this uh, this great uh, MacArthur Fellowship Award which gives you a year of doing what you already love doing, mm -hmm. which is great. You were recently selected as one of the, the top leaders in the country by Fortune magazine, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so what are you going to do with all that? What can we expect from you in the next five years? Well, I'll tell you what's at stake for me. The woman who raised me is my grandmother, who is 89, and she lives in Alhambra, California. 
and she potty trained me. She taught me my values. She taught me everything about how to live a good life, including how to cultivate laughter and joy. And at 89, she is active. She goes to church twice a week. She sings in the church senior choir. Great. She plays mahjong with her friends. She has a truly dignified quality of life, and that is made possible by a home care worker named Mrs. Sun, who is a part of my family's care team, makes sure that my grandmother gets to church on time, that she has the help that she needs to live well. And so where I want to go and where I want this movement to go is for Mrs. Sons all across the country to have support and dignity and the ability to live well and support their families and for every one of our grandmothers to have that, that choice and that dignity as well. I think I'm getting something that, that you've been hinting at and that this is ultimately um, this question of family. It's a question of reinforcing the family such as it exists as an institution in this country, but it's also expanding the notion of family. It is, that's and, right. And to have larger groups involved in sort of a family connection. That's right. And in fact, I go, I'll go for a wild step now, <laughs> having the country become a family. It is exactly right. That is exactly right. In this moment of change, so much demographic change, generational change, economic change, we must come together as a country with a shared vision for the future of our families, our health, and our economy. And this is the moment to do that. And caregiving is a perfect issue around which we can do that. Last question. Yes. Your book says it's preparing for the elder boom in a changing America. We've talked for the past 45 minutes about America. We've talked about American history, sociology, mor mores, legislation, all that. We haven't talked globally, though. Mm. So my question is, th th does what you're saying, is what you're doing relate to a larger, a larger humanity? Absolutely. One of the top five global megatrends is the age wave. People are living longer, and there are all kinds of generational gaps in terms of the need for care and, um, and rising global inequality. And the fact of the matter is, is that care jobs are at the bottom of the economy globally. And that needs to transform if we're going to transform inequality. So this is a global question. And there are other countries that have been grappling with it for longer. Japan, for instance. They've actually developed a very sophisticated time banking system called the Caring Relationship Tickets, where you can go and provide care and support for a neighbor for a couple of hours go buy groceries for them, cook for them, what have you, and then bank that time so that your mother on the other side of the country can get that same support from someone else in, in her neighborhood. Or you can bank it for yourself for when you need care one day. And so there's lots of innovative solutions that people are developing globally, and I believe that the United States can and should be on the forefront of solutions here. Great, and you're inventing it here. One, one last thing is, uh, see that camera over there? That's number one. Okay. <clears throat> Those mm -hmm. are people, okay, mm -hmm. who are individuals. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could take a minute and talk to them. And um, in the hypothetical that they like what you're saying, mm -hmm. what should they do in order to advance this idea? Should. Individually. They're right there. All right. Well, um, we welcome you to join Caring Across Generations. And you can do that by... Um, going to www.caringacrossamerica.com and on that site you'll see a little discussion guide called Let's Talk and it has two simple questions that we're asking you to take to your family dinner tables and essentially how can we as a family prepare for our future caregiving needs and the second question being what do we foresee could be the joys of caring for one another and, and planning together and hopefully that will spark a conversation that's valuable to your family. And we want your help in making this a national conversation. So share the outcomes of that discussion. And then to contact your local legislator and let them know how important long-term care is to you and how important becoming a more caring Hawaii, a more caring America is to you. Wow. There's something else you can do. 
You can go to uh, St. Andrew's Cathedral tomorrow at what, what time? Six o'clock. Six o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see the book signing. That's and right. And you can meet Ajin personally. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> That's Ajin Poo. She's a MacArthur Fellow and much more. Now you understand why, how that works now. <laughs> uh, here in Community Matters, The Age of Dignity uh, by Ajin Poo. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>